First of all, we have Brian Baker. Uh, he's worked in organic agriculture since 1983. He was Omri's first employee, and before that, he worked for California Certified Organic Farmers, or CCOF. He's also worked for the research, uh, Institute for Research for Organic Agriculture, or FIBL, in Switzerland, and he is the past president of IFOAM North America. Brian continues to do contract work for Omri, and he serves on Omri's advisory council. Brian lives here in Eugene, Oregon. Lynn Cody has been active in the organic industry since 1974. She was a founder and has been an active contributor to Oregon Till, Omri, and the Oregon Organic Coalition. She currently owns Organic Ag Systems Consulting, which provides technical assistance to producers and regulatory agencies. For 15 years, Lynn taught a short course on organic regulation and oversight for master's students at the Institute of Mediterranean Agriculture. And she also lives here in Eugene. Kim Dietz is business development director for organic extracts and sustainability for Fermanage Incorporated. She has more than 30 years of consumer packaged goods experience. Kim currently is serving her fifth year as president of the Organic Trade Association or OTA. She has served on the National Organic Standards Board, the NOSB, and the California Organic Products Advisory Board, or COPAC. Kim lives in Chico, California. Zia Sonnabend is a certified organic farmer at Fruitalicious Farms in, fruit, excuse me, Fruitalicious Farm in Watsonville, California. She grows 10 acres of apples, pears, figs, quince, citrus, stone fruit, and much more. She retired in 2019 after working for more than 30 years with CCOF. She worked for several years as a contractor conducting technical reviews to establish the first national list for the USDA. Zia coordinated the Ecological Farming Conference in California for 15 years, and she has served for many years on OMRI's Crops Review Panel and Advisory Council. And Bill Wolf is president of Wolf & Associates, a consulting firm helping companies to develop and certify organic products. Bill also founded Thorben, the first certified organic agricultural seaweed company, uh, which does have some OMRI listed products, and the Necessary Trading Company, the first national organic farming supply company, and he was a founder of New Resource Bank, the first community bank organized to serve organic and sustainable businesses. Bill has served as president of the OTA and was the founding board president of OMRI. Bill currently runs a small organic farm in Virginia. So I wanna welcome each of these people uh, to be with us today. I consider each of these individuals to be organic, uh, an organic pioneer and my friend. I've known them all since before I came to OMRI in 2010 and I've got a great deal of respect for each of them. So I'm gonna turn it over to our esteemed presenters. We don't have an agenda or a script or, or a format. It's gonna be kind of like a free for all, free discussion. Um, and so you're gonna hear from Omri's first employees, uh, Brian and Lynn, and uh, our, some of our first board members. Uh, they're gonna tell us about their experiences. And I did, did tell them that some of the things that I think uh, staff would be interested in, I would be interested in hearing about, would be how they came up with the Omri name and logo um, how they came up with the organization's mission, uh, the development of the first OMRI uh, products list, and uh, how did the review criteria and process uh, come to be. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our presenters. And again, please feel free to uh, write in the chat if you've got questions or comments, and uh, I will do my best to facilitate this. And now I'm just gonna turn it over to our presenters and see what you have to say. I think that's scary, Peggy, because, you know, we're going to have to have the hook for somebody to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't think about that for all you guys. Yeah. I think uh, I think our president should start, Bill. Sure. President of Omri. <laughs> well, I was dragged in by a hook somewhat like what you see in the background, which is an old <laughs> antique hay hook, to by by a process that involved um, an organization called OFPANA, the Organic Foods Production Association of North America, which became the Organic Trade Association. 
and Ofpana was looking at all the parts of what the industry needed, what the community needed for support, and also how to fund a trade association that was very small. It had 200 members and had essentially no uh, paid staff or budget other than all volunteer board, um, and was beginning to raise money to hire an executive director who uh, we did hire, Catherine DiMatteo who was actually also on, on one of Omri's early boards. Um, and Ofpana was looking at the possibility that it could create a materials, a national materials review organization as a, as a part of OTA. And a board retreat discussed that possibility and decided instead to reach out to everyone who was already doing materials review. And it turned out that there was already pretty serious discussion occurring bef between several certifiers and coordination of their efforts to review materials. So we, we kind of advocated for that alignment and began the process. And I'll, I'd like actually to kind of pass the baton to Zia, who has some documents to share about that early history. One of the, one of the early processes I was involved in was, was a, a, a committee that reviewed all the different materials lists and compared them. At the time there were, I, I'm guessing, a do, I don't have it in front of me, but a dozen, a dozen certifiers who had various materials lists and they were all similar, but there were differences. And one of the things we published was a comparison of those lists and found that there were several, there were very few differences. What's interesting for Omri today is that those differences that we identified then are still some of the disputed or difficult things to deal with today, 20, uh, 20 three years later, uh, chilean nitrate, sodium nitrate is one of them, piperinol butoxide was, was one of them and that got resolved. I won't go into a lot of detail, but that most certifiers didn't al allow things like sodium nitrate, a few did, and we ended up with this sort of compromise position. And a lot of that work that that Zia and Lynn, Zia was doing at CCOF, Lynn was doing at Oregon Tilth, and Peter Murray, who isn't on the call because he's passed away, but he was one of the early founders as well, was, was doing at OCIA, uh, sort of merged a lot of the alignment to, to create a common, common perspective. Later, I, 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 I'll talk about the differences in the possibilities of the naming of the organization, but I think um, Zia has some really, really good documents to share, so I'll pass the baton. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, all right, so um, I'm going to talk about how we did materials review bef before we founded OMRI and what led up to the desire to found OMRI. So um, when we started this effort in CCOF, um, we did. There were no written down rules even for organic, except maybe I think it was a two-page document about you know how to be organic. And so we decided we set out to write the first handbook for how to be organic. This was 1985. Pretty quickly, we discovered that if we're going to have a handbook, we got to have something about what materials you could and couldn't use. And so what we decided to do was um, ask the CCOF members, of which there were about 200 at the time, uh, what they thought was good and what wasn't. So Peggy, if you can put up the first document. Um, and you have to keep in mind that at the time, we didn't have computers. We didn't, many of the copying functions were still being mimeographed <laughs> instead of uh, all those Xerox had come in, but that's why like on this newsletter, the type setting is. So scroll down to the bottom of this page. Oh, not quite that far down. All right. Anyway, um, 
So this is the announcement that we want where it says, thanks for your help, this certification committee. We're asking people to say what materials they use and what they don't. So we got, I don't know, a few uh, dozen responses. So keep going, scroll down, Peggy, some more. All right, and then we tabulated it by hand. Um, and so as, keep scrolling if you wouldn't mind to the bottom. This is just, these are, this is a portion of a multi-page document that you can see that most people want, wanted to use or not. And um, I was farming at the time we started this and it was all volunteer work. And um, we had a little committee that consisted of Amigo Bob, uh, who has since passed, Kate Burroughs, uh, Eric Gleesman, and a couple of other people who looked at all the responses. And at the time, we also didn't really fully understand the difference between a generic material or a brand name product. So if you want to go to the next document, Peggy. So uh, after we got our first what questionnaire tabulate, we put it out there and we said, okay, here's the things that everyone wants and here's the things we're not sure about. And we came up with this second uh, questionnaire that we sent out to everybody. Um, and you can see there's, um, like Bill said, some things that have been resolved and some things that are still a little uh, controversial today. So uh, go to the next document, if you would. The contra so these, um, <laughs> that's going backwards. Okay, these are the controversial materials that we uh, we didn't fully have. Oh no, no, this is go to document three, Peggy, because you're that was four. Yeah, this one. Okay, so, and scroll down a little bit. So these are the ones that we decided were controversial in the first go round. And you can see here, uh, some things we didn't fully understand what they were, like chelates, um, micronutrient sprays is pretty general, and some things which, um, you know, we have settled. So um, now go to the fourth document. And yeah, see, as we go down there, you'll see some um, brand names in there. So here we tabulated um, everything that people wanted or didn't want. And we ended up coming up with the first materials list, which I believe was in the 1987 CCOF handbook. <clears throat> so um, now go to document number five. Because this is such classic history, I just wanted to show you what enforcement was like in those days. <laughs> Brian, I know is familiar with this. Um, this, <laughs> this classic piece of enforcement material was from a random guy, um, Mr. Cassidy, Mark Cassidy, known as J. Edgar Cassidy. <laughs> who took it upon himself to try and catch cheaters and he did it by driving around to their fields and camping out in them to see if he could catch them doing something wrong and so he had this little thing called the OFBI that he uh handed out to people so anyway um pretty quickly after, i think by 1988 or 9 we had uh, by 19 or maybe even still in 87 we realized that Oregon Tilth, we had started meeting regularly with Oregon Tilth and Washington State. Washington State couldn't join us because of the state regulations, but Oregon Tilth said, well, why should duplicate efforts? Let's team up and review materials together. So Lynn um, and Diana Tracy from Oregon joined our little group, and we proceeded to refine our work in uh, both generics and then pretty quickly we realized that we needed a separate brand name list because of the issues of additives, inert ingredients, and blended products. And so we came out with the first brand names list. And by that time, I believe, Brian, had you joined us by the first brand names list? I think you had, right? Yeah. 
you're just, talking about your muted. A, yeah, I, I was on mute, but yeah, just about that time. Um, so I joined CCOF in 1988, and by that time you had published the uh, first brand names list. It, it had been out for a while, okay. but there were, of course, many brand names not on it. Yeah. Okay. So then we had a light bulb went off at some point. I actually, as much as I remember anything from those days, remember this, <laughs> when Amelia said, you know, we could be charging for this brand names list. And... So that's when the concept of um, trying to charge the companies to have their materials listed because of the extreme marketing advantage they would get. And not long after that, we realized, well, you know, we really need to be national if we're gonna do this because otherwise other certifiers are gonna have fees and it doesn't make any sense. So this actually coincided uh, fairly co nicely with the LR scare in 1988, which brought many of us to Washington in the organic movement to an off PANA meeting to decide what to do about LR and organic and all of that. And so I brought our work to this off PANA meeting and that's where I met Bill for the first time went at the off PANA technical committee uh, where I walked in and said, here, look at this materials list and Bill said, oh, we've been doing this already in off Pana for a lot of the um, mostly East Coast certifiers. And so um, we teamed up with off Pana to do a survey of the all the certifiers like Bill was talking about, about which products and um, generics they wanted. And um, then we had a little wait while we're waiting for the actual formation of the NOSB after the federal rule after OFA was enacted. And um, it became clear that the early NOSB had their hands full even trying to get a national list together. Um, you know, keeping in mind when we were doing all this work, there was no national list to give us guidance. We were just kind of uh, making it up as we thought appropriate. And um, while a lot of people thought that the NOP and NOSB should be doing brand name review, we quickly realized they did not have that capability. And so that led to us wanting to be national and, and form OMRI. So Peggy, if you wanna show the uh, OMRI organizational meeting notes. And then I'll let someone else take it away to discuss from here. Um, I think I could probably take it as secretary because I was secretary of Omri. Um, and I, you know, I, I just must say that I was, um, I was mentored by all these folks on the call. Um, I was hired by Bill Knudsen of the Knudsen Juice Company um, to work for him. I was in, 20 years old, I believe. And he at the time was president of OTA. So Bill graciously allowed me to get in the thick of it with these folks on, on um, committees and task forces and, and what have you, and really kind of gave me carte blanche to say, let's, you know, what, what's needed from the industry side, right? So how can we help? Um, we've got all these great folks doing the technical work and the the business set up, but how do we, how can we help as a trade? And so I, I started working with all of them um, and we had these meetings and it was quite, it, you know, we, we really pretty much founded and started Omri. Um, you know, my notes, I show 1996. So this is, again, it coincides with, the, with our first minutes of the, of the meetings. Um, we put a lot of time and effort into it. <laughs> we had some crazy, crazy sessions. Uh, so, but it, but it worked, and we did everything from how do we fund Omri, you know, who's who's going to help us get this work done, you know, what's our logo look like. I'll just I'll just talk about the logo because uh, one thing that Bill did was graciously offer his staff, and we had a graphic designer at the time who actually developed the very first Omri logo. We we knew we wanted Ohm in there somewhere, right? Or, or And that's how we became Omri, the Organic Materials Review Institute. So that 
that term ohm um, was prevalent in many, many, many of the first markups of the, the logo. Um, and that's really where we started. So I'll turn it over to somebody else, but you know, we, we worked hard and nimble, um, not always got along, right? We had, we had our um, moments, but at the end of the day, um, really, really, really came up with the, with the, you know, you're all employed there. It's just an amazing story of how it's grown and evolved into being a really, really functional part of the organic industry today. I'd like to go back. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'd like to go back to the beginning again and talk a little bit about how things emerged from the Oregon side. Um, as Zia mentioned, at Oregon Tilt, we had a small group that was headed by Diana Tracy and me who were looking at materials. And the impetus for us was largely because a bill had been introduced into the Oregon State Legislature by a consumer group. And it was not a pretty picture for um, organic as we knew it in Oregon. So we had to get that bill removed from the legislature and rewritten by uh, organic activists, which uh, I was one. And the other two that were actual writers were Jack Gray and Robert Despain. Um, both, we were working together um, mostly out of um, organically grown, which was then organically grown co-op. These were very early days. Um, however, like Zia described, they needed a, um, a materials list for CCOF's use. In our case, we needed it for immediate digestion by the Oregon State Legislature. So we had a number of different foundation documents, including the Afpana list and some of the work that we had been doing in Oregon Tilt. And we put together the first materials list that was codified by, um, by a government. So that happened in 1980. We worked on it in 1988. In 1989, the bill was passed. Um, so in the course of all that was when we were working together with Washington State and CCUF, as Zia mentioned, in a group called the Western <laughs> Alliance of Certified Organizations, or WACO. We loved having these, these wacky, <laughs> especially that group was particularly wacky and, and enjoyable and fun. So um, we got into the weeds on materials. In fact, I, I was uh, asked to facilitate the very first meeting of WACO where we sat around and we went through all of the standards and many materials and said, where do we agree and where do we disagree? So that was another pivotal opportunity of, of actually a very intense um, and detailed cooperation and um, compromise session to try to figure out what we would do. And so our goal in WACO was to try to eventually um, bring these three state laws into alignment. So that was a big effort in Oregon. And we, we were um, pushed along a little bit faster than the other states as far as materials went. But it was a great relief when we finally uh, were able to join in with the CCOF um, materials group that as Zia described and uh, Diana and I used to fly down or sometimes that we would have meetings in different places where we could get together and actually work together to bring our two organizational lists into alignment. So I was was tracking, I, I had a, <laughs> it wasn't even a database. We were just starting to use computers now and so I had a big giant Word document that, that was tracking what CCOF did and what Oregon Tilt did. Um, not even not even a not even a database. Um, so that became the very beginning of the generic list for Omri when we when we started working together with Omri, and then we started bringing in information that Peter Murray contributed and other other groups. So that had to be turned into a database and then turned into a generic list. So
so that was that was kind of the Oregon track of how we got going. And and one of my favorite um, ideas about the Omri, the name of Omri actually was a goofy suggestion to call it the Horrible Materials Institute, because we realized right away that we were going to grapple with the most horrible materials that were on all of our lists from across the country. And that was Omri's legacy to, to grapple with this. Luckily, we did, we did not actually name it the Horrible Materials Institute. But in my mind, there were many days when it was actually called that. So I'll stop there. Yes, well, I, I remember the, the Horrible Materials Institute, the first time it came up was at an NOSB meeting held in Cottage Grove, Oregon. And uh, we, yeah, we just said, what are we going to do with all of these horrible materials issues? I know, we'll start a Horrible Materials Institute. And uh, the, the uh, mystery man in the room who helped us with that was a fellow by the name of Kay Chandler. Uh, who's also passed on, but he's he was the technical representative, the scientist on the NOSB at the time. And he was also someone who was looking, he, he knew suppliers pretty well. In fact, he, he sold a few products himself. Uh, but yeah, he, he came up with a few ideas in terms of structure and helped us rethink what we were doing. A few months before that, I had met Bill Wolf for the first time at another NOSB meeting in, in Cutstown, Pennsylvania at the Rodale Institute. And it was very interesting to hear us finish each other's sentences. We could almost tell what the other was thinking at the time. And we, we were just going very quickly through all the problems and seeing very clearly uh, so many opportunities for solution. But if you step back, um, there was quite a bit of polarization within the organic community, even if there was widespread agreement about some of the specifics about the materials. Um, there were also some very sharp differences in terms of approach, and those played out in the course of the NOSB meetings and the first proposed rule. So what you had was a situation with California and to a certain extent with Oregon and Washington, uh, looking at the California Organ Organic Foods Act at that time being the de facto national regulation. Uh, California was the largest market. California was the largest producer of organic food. Um, it was the source for so much of the fresh deal coming back east that the California Organic Foods Act um, cl um, claim was on all sorts of food being shipped interstate. Um, but at the same time, you had uh, agriculture in the Midwest dominated by grains and later by dairy production. And that approach was much more, um, let's say, conservative with uh, materials review. Um, those engaged in the production of fruits and vegetables are, uh, had more intensive production and had a, a use of materials that were not widely used. In the Midwest, production was much more low input. Uh, organic production was much more low input. And you had in California, under the California Organic Foods Act, you had this synthetic, non-synthetic non distinction with a list of statutory exceptions. The California legislature set those exceptions. Those were not administered by, at the, at the first, um, at the beginning by the health department. It was uh, California Department of Health Services that, it, that administered the Cal original California Organic Foods Act. It later got changed over to the uh, food and uh, uh, FD to CDFA. Um, but um, in uh, the Midwest, um, you had producers who were exporting to Europe and they were using um, the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements list of materials, um, which was a much more limited list at the time. And it was, uh, the approach was a closed positive list. If it's on the list, you can use it. It doesn't matter if it's synthetic or non-synthetic. 
if it's not on the list, you can't use it, even if it's natural. Um, and um, you had a uh, another group of people who uh, were marching under the banner of agronomic responsibility, which was, we don't need a materials list. Anything that's that can be used in agriculture can be used responsibly in organic agriculture. The question is, are you building the soil? Are you farming biologically? Are you uh, are you improving um, the, the farming situation? And and that was um, taken as a serious alternative um, approach to both uh, both the um, iPhone and California approaches. Um, and much of the first proposed rule reflected the agronomic responsibility um, position. Um, but building up to that, we needed to resolve the disputes that were taking place between certifiers. And this was hurting farmers, it was hurting suppliers, it was, it was constraining the organic market and we needed to have some way to um, to resolve conflict and um, there was also the the problem of redundancy so um, having 20 30 different certifiers review a, a brand name product was uh, an unnecessary burden on the different suppliers and the, and the certifiers more or less ag uh, agreed that it was uh, a lot of certifiers were just using the CCOF TILF list. Um, they figured, well, CCOF and TILF know what they're doing. Um, we'll just <laughs> photocopy their list and hand it to our clients. And, uh, you know, I, plagiarism is the sincerest form of flattery. Um, CCOF members were paying for my salary. Um, you know, TILF was paying Lynn, maybe not enough, but they were paying her and um, we had, um, you know, other others who were using our work but not giving credit where credit was due. And uh, so I'd go to these certifiers and say, uh, hey, you know, it's really great. You're getting your act together and you're finally enforcing the regulations in California, but uh, how's about paying us for our list? And they said, no, we don't think that's a good idea, and uh, and the and back east, you know, the the certifiers said, well, you're big bad California, you know, thanks for the list, but you've got enough money already, um, and so we we went to a couple of different um, uh, we we had a couple of different attempts to try and figure it out, and and we uh, started charging like a hundred dollars per per product. Uh, to get on the list, and that was helping to cover some of the expenses. Um, but what ended up happening was that uh, we tr tried to get um, certifiers to subscribe. They wouldn't pay CCOF directly. Uh, we went to the Organic Trade Association. Um, there was pushback there because it was seen by several certifiers and by uh various state agencies and um frankly the nop as well that it, that it would be a conflict of interest to ota for ota to run it we approached the organic materials review institute um and they thought it was outside of uh, um, ofrs mission uh and they politely uh but firmly turned us down there and uh that was kind of when Kay Chandler came on the scene and just said, you know, you've got to have your own organization and it's not going to work if anyone's, if it's just one certifier, it's not going to work if it's OTA. Um, and so that was a, about a three-year process. Um, the bylaws, we borrowed heavily from Underwriters Laboratory. So the business model for Underwriters Laboratory if you go back about 120, 130 years, this there was this technology called electricity, and it was a kind of a new thing. And um, you know, people would um, plug in appliances, and their houses would burn down. And um, that wasn't 
very helpful for the electric industry or for appliance manufacturers. And, you know, the fire departments and insurance companies were saying, we're, you know, get rid of this electricity stuff. It's just not going to work for us, you know. And the, and the uh, electric utilities and the appliance manufacturers said, no, it can be safe. We can, we can come up with ways to make sure that electricity is safe. We just need building codes and wiring codes, and we need to evaluate uh, appliances. And um, so the the deal was that um, the industry would pay for it, and the insurance companies and the fire departments would run it. So you had this um, had this governance model, which prevented conflicts of interest, and and had those. Um, those agencies that were responsible for maintaining public safety um, in the having having control over it, but there was recognition that the appliance manufacturers and the utilities had a stake, so they were stakeholders that were also admitted, and so the the whole question of checks and balances to avoid conflicts of interest and to make sure that we were we were serving the public interest and qualified for 501c3 status with the IRS uh, led to the bylaws that we developed. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, there are a couple of other tangents I could go on, but um, why don't I just uh, say that's that's my background. I was um, working at CCOF, and then um, there was a, a deal where CCOF would retain some of its funding. Some of the funding we collected from um, materials uh, applications. So the materials application fee was increased. The the amount of the increase, which I think we went from one hundred to two hundred dollars. So one hundred dollars went to CCOF. One hundred dollars went into a restricted account that would be Omri. That would be Omri's, and. Um, when I uh, when I left um, California on June 1st, 1997, um, I drove up with my pickup truck, with um, just packed with files in the in the uh, bed of the pickup truck, and a check for about ten thousand dollars in my pocket, and the check was made out to Omri. So that was how we um, how we got it off the ground in part. Yeah, so, you know, if you can imagine from, you know, 1996 when we had our first meeting to 1997 when Brian drove his truck with all the paperwork to Oregon, um, there was a lot of, there was a lot of work being done on the grounds to get this, to get this moving. You know, we had commitments, we had, we had support, we had, you know, the industry behind us, most of it anyways. Um, but we also had financial back backing. So I'm just going to name off some of the organizations, which, you know, me going through my notes the last few weeks, I, I, you know, I recalled the, this, but honestly, it's, it's amazing that we all pulled it together. So obviously CCOF and TILF, right, you know, the certifiers that were going to see, well, they were doing a lot of work in it. They almost wanted to shove it off to somebody else. So we gladly took it. Um, so CCOF, TILF, we had OCIA, um, you know, the Trade Association, OTA was involved. Sorry, my cat's coming in. Um, OFRF, uh, the Association for Regional Agriculture. Oh, I'm going to have to stop. Um, anyway, and then industry, we had Newman's Own. It was involved Whole Foods, um, Smuckers, because obviously I worked for Smuckers and the Humane Society. So really it was a very eclectic funding um, group who started Omri and then and then we were well on our way. Uh, I'm gonna jump in there, Kimmer, if if that's all right, because I think you've you've laid a great groundwork for kind of the, the question of monetizing the work that Omri does. And, and monetizing was a discussion that went all the way back to when Brian and I chatted in Pennsylvania. How do, how do you, who needs this service? Who's going to pay for it? And well, what will the benefits be? Um, at the time, I was a 
I was a fertilizer manufacturer who was facing the most ridiculous situation in the world because the data for each product had to go to each separate certification agency, a dozen, and to every farmer in, in some cases in order to, to assure that it was allowed. And this is, I mean, I'm talking, you know, late 1980s, even before NO, NOP or off pan, the OFPA, the law itself, which took 12 years to actually implement. And at that time, many off pana had a uh, an input group of of fertilizer and input companies that were complaining and saying how do we solve this we need a unified approval process rather than going to each certifier and parallel to that was this conversation about you know what are the services that are needed to make make the organic one national unified standard uh, so that comparison of this of the this the uh, lists was part of that process in 1989 at the time off pana had published what well, the in 1985 actually had published another document that would be useful to have on omri's uh history which is the guidelines for organic production and it meant a number was certifiers being were being encouraged to align their standards with those guidelines and then were asked to try to align with that off panel list that was published in 89 which had an, a list of allowed materials restricted materials and prohibited materials so it was a combination of sort of the the u.s version of a non-synthetic synthetic list and a, and, a, and the ifoam approach to uh, to a positive list so the conversations actually Bill Knudsen led a led a board retreat to talk about monetizing all the issues that the that the organic community needed at the time. Um, and one of I'll take a little side sidebar story about Bill because he came up with when we were sitting there at, at this weekend retreat, he came up with the idea that we should have a bake sale. He said, everybody raises money with bake sales. And we were sitting around this table saying, Bill, what are you talking about? And he said, we've got the distribution system. We've got hundreds of retailers who want to su su support organic. We can do it a little like, you know, the Girl Scouts bake sale. Once a year for organic month in the month of September, which at the time was organic month, um, it was harvest month we'll get every retailer in the country to put boxes of organic cookies on their retail counter and they'll and all the money will go back through the distribution systems to to a, a you know a mission based fund to do education and research to promote and promotion for organic and that was one of a number of funding ideas of what how to how to raise money and another was to create a national input review process and uh the discussion went went pretty deep into how do you monetize that at that point i got involved um I, with trying to actually understand what ccos fee structure was what oregon tilt C fee, fee ocia's fee NOFA New York's, some of the NOFAs were charging to review materials at the time. Um, Virginia Association of Biological Farmers was starting to charge for materials review. And so we did this little analysis of what would what would it look like if instead of 20 to an input an input company paying half a dozen certifiers, what would happen if they paid for one national review? And the conversation the underwriter's lab concept emerged as a good model for how do you have a nonprofit do uh, essentially the infrastructure support behind an industry because underwriter's labs became how buildings became safe as Brian described. How does, how did, but they don't, underwriter's labs doesn't deal with you know the the actual construction plans they deal with all the the details all the support details and so there has to be this infrastructure to support 
the underpinning of how organic products are grown and processed. And we we looked at it and said there there's a there's a important service, and it it needs to be merged. And so the conversation about monet merging the costs and giving benefits to all the organizations that were already starting to do it led eventually to to the discussions about how to uh, have CCOF, Oregon Tilth, OCIA, and others give up their programs, so to speak, and don't you know transfer those programs to what became OMRI. And there was negotiating. Um, it, and the negotiating and the contracts were actually, there were written contracts that were, were reached to determine what OMRI would pay for, or in what form the pay would occur for the different organizations. At the time, uh, WSDA, Washington State Department of Ag, was in some of the early conversations and said, we're a state agency. We actually can't give up our, our, our materials review and we can't participate in the way you're talking about, but we're supportive of the concept. I remember very clearly the, the negotiations with the executive director of CCOF about giving up CCOF's program. Uh, Diane Bowen was the ED at the time and, and she was she said, we want CCOF members to receive OMRI, OMRI services forever. There was a quiet moment in the small group that was sitting there saying, uh, forever is a long time and that's not going to work. And there was a similar conversation with Yvonne Frost and Peter Murray was taking that same discussion back to the OCIA board to ask what to do with what they would what they would pet what they would sell their program for essentially and we came to an agreement across the board for free services for a specified period of time i don't have those documents in front of me right now i actually probably still have them and uh, could un unfurl them but it, it ended up being in the three to five year period where we we said okay you, you got a you got this free program for somewhere in the three to five years in, in return for turning over your materials list service. And there was, it was fairly complex because CCOF's programs were contracts with specific input companies and confidential agreements. So there had to be uh, bringing those agreements over to the new organization and, and getting those companies to agree to do that. Um, so. I was involved in, in some of those pieces, but uh, I the conversation about where will the organization be was really clear. Yvonne said, we're not giving up the program unless Lynn is deeply involved in it and is, you know, in the management of running it. And CCOF was saying, we're not giving up the program unless Brian is involved. And Lynn said, I'm not moving from Eugene. <laughs> and Brian said, I can move. And thus, Brian drove his pickup truck from California up to Eugene, and, and that's why it's in Eugene, Oregon. And OCIA didn't even try to say, bring bring it to the Midwest. There was oh, no. Oh, no, Bill. They wanted me to move to Lincoln. Oh, Nebraska. Well, they were... Yeah, that, they were they said they didn't have they didn't have any no, support they didn't from, have the, a chance. from the, I wasn't from the move east coast from the east coasters. I, I liked coming to Eugene. <laughs> <laughs> in those days and sleeping on the floor in your in your in your house um, when we when we worked together for several years during that period I do want to take one little side trip about Yvonne and the name o OMRI and and again uh, Bill Knudsen at the time I'll go back one more step off Panna's name was not working as a name Everybody, Organic Foods Production Association of North America. And for two and a half years, there were conversations about what to change the name to. At that same board retreat where we discussed monetizing different services, 
we had a discussion about different names. For, it was on the it was actually on the Eastern Shore weekend after an Expo East in Baltimore, and uh, it was an evening discussion about names. And somehow we we were debating the different names, and OTA was in the lead, but nobody could compel it to happen. And there was a bottle of wine involved. There were several, and Somebody started chanting, Ota, Ota. And we went, oh, that's a name that can really stick. And we'll, we'll always bring that up as, as a chant when we need to reinforce. Well, I haven't heard anyone call OTA, Ota, since that meeting. But when you said OM as part of Omri, it brought it back. And it's really kind of connecting back to those <laughs> those earlier roots of uh, the organic community. I was an advocate of the name Omri as well, but with a slightly different twist. And that was also tied to the Underwriters Labs principle, Organic Materials Research Institute, with the goal being that we, the monetizing of the, of the organization was that the income was from reviewing the materials and the and a substantial portion of the the funds that were collected would be do would be used to actually research the efficacy of those inputs by showing whether they actually helped organic farmers there was quite a debate about that and at the time Yvonne was quite vocal uh, I, I wish I had a recording of some of the language she used <laughs> to, to explain why this was a terrible idea. Underneath it was partially a defense of Oregon Tilt's mission, which at the time was to do research, and a concern that we might be stepping on OFRF's uh, ta tail. Oh, there's a picture Yay. of Yvonne. Yay, thank you. Yay. And thank you, Yvonne, bless you. Yvonne was, won that debate. I'll never know whether that was, what would have happened if we had been the Organic Materials Research Institute, but the core income and the monetizing of it is based on review of inputs. So that's kind of a full circle of, of some of my, my thoughts about how we got where we are. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to scroll through these pictures since you've been talking about some of these people. Mm -hmm. um, let me go back to that. Peter uh, Murray. Peter. Yeah, there he is. And, and an old Omri listed logo. Yeah, we had a banner which we took to trade shows and Pete, yeah. Peter and I and several other people because we might be at a trade show when when Brian and Lynn were doing all the hard work back, back at uh, and we'd be there for business and we'd help run a booth. Well, remember the Expo East meeting where we were the three Omri's? You, me, and oh. Peter, Bill? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, three, the three Omri's. And for those of you wondering where Peter went, Peter um, Peter had restored this boat. It was an old Chris Craft boat. I'll never forget it because my, my dad had a Chris Craft. And he was, uh, I think they were just trying it out or something. Anyway, the boat had an issue and and he and his uh, somebody they were killed on the boat i think it exploded yeah. or something he and um, his best friend would go fishing for a week yeah. in the and they just put a new carburetor in it and the company yeah. put the wrong carburetor and it blew up anyway he was he was young and passionate and and you can't see it in the picture but he had bright red hair and um he was kind of our grounding in some ways peter would you know hold it he would get up there and he had the he would he would say yes you can do it or no you couldn't we sometimes we just had to listen to him yeah, well, he, he and he was vice, he was vice president of the board yeah. for many yeah. many years he also uh was one of the one of the early auth co-authors of gots the global yeah. organic right. uh, textile standards so he was always looking at that where where's the next frontier so to speak there's marty Marty Mesh, uh, we realized early on in, in Omri that we needed to have really good geographical representation on the board as well as 
um, stakeholders from different um, realms of who benefit from materials review. So uh, Marty joined us from Florida. Do you have a picture of Emily? Yep. Oh, Emily, oh Catherine. Uh, Catherine DiMatteo yeah. from Organic Trade Association. Uh, Emily Brown Rosen, who from New Jersey, who worked for several certifiers back east. And then became policy director at Omni. Yeah, yeah our, then worked for Omni for a while, and then went on to work for the NOP. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a pretty diverse group. Is there, are, do you have more pictures, Peggy? Well, it, That's I, all I've got. I say, can I say okay. a word or two I, about the composition of the advisory council and how important that was? Yeah. Well, can yeah. I just bring up one point first, Brian? Sure. Here go we go. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> my cold times. Well, okay, um, raise your <laughs> raise your hand first, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, Go ahead. I guess the, uh, <laughs> what I wanted to bring up is that um, the climate was very different back then in the world of materials review because not everything was settled, and so um, at an NOSB meeting, for instance, there were be any number of lobbyists for different products who would want to get their product approved. And um, this is, you know, partly what led to the horrible Materials Institute idea is that people from the leather meal lobby, which included, you know, attorneys and guys from the uh, potassium chloride lobby. And uh, there was for a while a, a genetically engineered BT that would come to us and, and try to lobby for that. And they were a lot more around, and it was important to have a unified front from within the organic community from all the stakeholders to make it clear what it was we wanted and what we didn't want. So that once we had national a national board and national program, we could clearly, you know, air the issues around those materials, but then identify what was appropriate and what wasn't appropriate. Yeah, so but it was also very important to build capacity and to to come up with the technical expertise that was needed to withstand what would inevitably result in um, challenging our decisions and our decision making process. So part of the way we were able to get buy in from OCIA from uh, Florida Organic Growers later QCS from the NOFAs from MOFCA was to say hey you guys are smart you know what you're doing you've got some really good sharp people working for you can you spare some time to work with omri and help us get started and help us with review and let's let's see what we can do to build consensus around some of these things we don't agree on we agree on most things that's not a problem let's let's see what we can do to have the advisory council we'll call it the advisory council we'll have all of these really smart people we'll pay them an honorarium it's not going to be much but it we're going to you know recognize and that we value your time and it's just a couple of meetings a year we'll uh and we'll do these these uh polls and where we have consensus that's great and we can take that consensus to the omri board and to the nosb and see what we can do to get that accepted as the um the regulation or interpretation of the regulation um, and where we don't have consensus, we put materials in unresolved status. So, you know, in the case of, of Florida, we had Rosie Koenig, um, we had uh, Eric Seidman from MOFCA, we had Tom Thomas from Farm Verified Organic, later ICS. Um, we had Ernie Otter from OCIA, for example. We had a number of really, uh, you know, people who had, looked at these materials issues, these horrible materials issues from a different perspective and had in many cases a greater depth of understanding than those of us on the West Coast had because of the conditions there being different from the conditions here. So we were able to, um, by bringing them in, we were able to get buy-in and get uh, and be a more effective um, voice uh, representing the consensus of the organic community, um, not just the farmers, not just the suppliers, but all the stakeholders. And um, so we were able to um, be quite influential 
but still one obstacle, one thing, one bump, and, and I'm sure all of you will remember this, one bump that we faced in our first six months was um, on December 16th, 1997, the National Organic Program published the first proposed rule. And I just remember Lynn and I looking at it and saying, well, that's it. You know, they're going to allow everything. So we don't need a materials list anymore. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we spent night and day writing something like a 130 page comment to the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to the, to the uh, NOP. And, and that didn't even include all the appendices we attached. Um, and we worked around the clock. So Emily was on the East Coast, so she was up before Lynn, but not by much. And then <laughs> Lynn would take over when Emily would would call it quits, and then Lynn would hand it off to me, and I'd be working until one or two in the morning, and then handing it back to Emily um, in time when you know she was just getting out of bed at five in the morning East Coast. So we you know we that was a round the clock effort and and i was at that time pretty much um the only full-time person working at omri um certainly the only person who was who was not doing administrative work um and uh so i'd have to put in a full day of work at omri and then work for for another you know five or six hours on on our comments to the uh to the nop on the first proposed rule um so yeah that that was one of the things that almost killed omri at, at the start and i have to say that the national organic program was not very supportive of the idea of omri at the very beginning and no. there were a number of certification agents or certification bodies that also thought of Omri as a temporary solution that once the uh, once the rule goes final, um, the USDA is going to run a brand names review program. It's going to be a free service that they provide to all the certifiers, and they're basically going to tell us what uh, what's what. And so we'll you know we're we're into Omri until that day comes when the NOP replaces Omri. And I have to say that there was something appealing about that um, idea to a lot of certifiers. Um, and I and it plays into what Bill was saying about the Organic Materials Research Institute. Um, I, I what I saw, and I and Keith Jones, mind you, was an, a founding board member as well, who later on uh, became um, the head of the NOP. Um, we saw the different the review of the different inputs being taken over by the different entities that regulate those inputs, which in the case of EPA, pesticides, or case of pesticides, EPA would say what was okay to use in organic and what wouldn't be. The state uh, plant food control officials would make the determinations in the respective states um, for, you know, it would be FDA in, in the case of uh, food processing and animal drugs. Um, and, you know, that also obviously didn't happen. Um, so I, I, I see Lynn wants to talk next. Yeah. Lynn. Well, Brian, what you were saying about that incredible time frame where uh, we were tackling the comments for the first proposed rule reminded me that people should try, should remember that all of this work that we were doing in the early days of OMRI was without the benefit of a generic list. We did not have a national list. And so the first thing we had to do was to create a generic list. And the advisory panel spent significant time working on that, working through, gee, should we even, uh, should we even have um, material on the generic list in order to be able to eval use it as evaluation? So that's where a lot of these basic, very basic issues about agronomic responsibility or not found in nature, all these kind of philosophical ideas so were hammered out extensively. This was way beyond uh, debate. This was hammering out and sometimes hammering each other about 
what actually is organic and what materials should be included in just literally generically. Um, so that's why Omri's um, comments about the generic about the the first proposed rule were were so um, significant was that there was literally no generic list. Mm -hmm. So um, that was that was a point of contention within Omri as well because with limited resources, very limited resources, the the foundation of the generic list was basically a um, there was no way to fund it except for through um, generous <laughs> contributions of time from sort of from from qualified people from certifiers and um, psych taking some of the money from the brand names project and putting it into the generic list so it was kind of a a chicken and egg issue. We didn't have a way to evaluate materials without the generic list, but we didn't have any way to pay for the generic list. It was difficult. So um, I, I came along as the first policy director for OMRI, and that was my, my main focus, was to get some kind of a generic list on the table, to put it out for public review by the certifiers, and then um, to hand it off to Brian's department, which was supposed to be doing these more um, more focused work on the brand name review. So we were working in two different um, path, on two different paths that were so closely related. We had to have a lot of of uh, cross conversations about it and try to figure out exactly how to get a generic list that would work for both the foundation of what became the national list eventually and immediately for um, review of brand name materials. So there was, there, there was a very difficult um, um, dance to perform to, to try to work on all of those those aspects of materials review at the same time, both the, the very conceptual foundation of the generic list and at the same time, the very practical and important for funding uh, aspect of the brand name review. So that's a lot of what we were working on with Brian and I together and uh, Bill in the mix trying to guide the whole thing. And oh my goodness, it was, yes. it was not necessarily easy days. Well, part of it was getting the, the certifiers to subscribe and pay for a subscription. Now, as was mentioned before, CCOF wasn't going to pay any more than it already had. Neither was TILF. OCIA was reluctant to pay as well. But we, we would go to the other certifiers and we were able to get some money out of them. Um, <laughs> the other thing was the agreements with the certifiers allowed the certifiers to have access to the OMRI files if they if they saw fit. And they could always and they were in no way bound um, to accept Omri's opinion. They could uh, take Omri's opinion and then still decide to prohibit something. That was that was still their right, and they did not give that up when they subscribed to Omri. Um, but what really made my job difficult, you know, running the brand names program, was that if certifiers wanted to say yes, if there was a if there was an input, a brand name product that obviously was allowed and accepted by consensus. The um, suppliers could sell it to organic farmers and there wasn't any need for OMRI review. There wasn't any need for uh, having the product on the list. Everybody knew it was okay, uh, why bother? Um, so, but what, what would happen is certifiers who subscribe to OMRI would get stymied and they would they would come up with these unresolved questions and it's like instead of saying no often it's not they would say oh go ask omri and then right. if omri says it's okay then maybe we'll say it's okay but we're not required to say it's okay so even if omri says it's okay we can still prohibit it mm uh, the other side of that equation was the fact that the Organic Foods Production Act really had a had a gap in it, and and it still does. And that is, where 
the materials review responsibility and system lies. It, it, the, the structure of the organic, the, the USDA program is built around, the, the USDA accredits the certifiers, and this was a public-private partnership compromise essentially, and the certifiers review the 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 the, the grower or the process either the processor or the producer's organic system plan, and is responsible for making the decision as to whether that 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 operation is compliant with 7 CFR 205, the National Organic Program, on all the guidelines, and there isn't any designated materials review process inside of OFPA other than the national list of non-synthetic and pro prohibited non-synthetics and allowed synthetics. And in the guidance documents today, now there is a generic list that OMRI was responsible for pr basically providing to, to go through the process and be part of the guidance. But there's still essentially a gap. I mean, the fact is that a farmer comes forward and says, this is what I'm using, and the certifier has to make a determination if that's allowed or not, and generally now relies to a great extent on, on OMRI. But numerous times over the last uh, 20, 20 years, I, I've been asked, well, why is there an OMRI anymore now that there's a national organic program? And I've been asked that by all kinds of folks who were involved with OMRI or, or, or looking at what's the future. And the answer was, frankly, OFPA didn't adequately address it, and OMRI fills a very important gap in the regulatory process um, and is now recognized. One of the things that's kind of interesting is the history of, of getting a, some form of accreditation. Um, I, I was a strong advocate, and several other people were, of, of OMRI being accredited way back at the very beginning under an ISO standard or something like that. And that conversation was occurring before the, the National Organic Program accredited certifiers and actually uh, coincided with a conversation about livestock labeling in which the uh, USDA was not allowing any the use of the term organic on any livestock products because the, the National Organic Program had not yet been been implemented. Um, so they they came to a compromise and said, we'll allow uh, the term organic on meat products temporarily if the certifier is accredited by USDA to ISO 65. And that accelerated the conversation about OMRI getting accredited. Uh, but it, 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 it took too many years to get that accreditation. So that's... Um, we're... Is there a way to ask? Are, are your staff able to ask questions at this stage? Uh, something's happening. You're mute. You're, I see your lips moving, but we can't hear you. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, yes, I was going to say we've got 14 minutes left, so I was doing that time check. Uh, you already answered one question about, you know, how did uh, Omri choose Eugene? So that was taken care of. We do have another question, um, and I was going to add on to it also. Um, the question is, did you ever imagine that Omri would be this big uh, and successful? And my question, which is kind of similar, is, you know, is there anything that has surprised you as you've watched Omri over the last 20-plus uh, years? So that's the question as you'd like, whoever would like to answer those in the time we've got left. It never surprised me that Omri would be successful. I, it was so clear that such a thing was needed that um, I just knew that it would. Uh, I'm a little surprised that organic as a whole is so successful. Um, you know, I feel, guilty almost sometimes because having the responsibility to create a materials list is what really enabled organic to grow. Uh, any conventional farmer thinking of transition, they need to have clear rules. 
And you don't have clear rules unless you have a, a clear list of what you can and cannot use. And so to the extent that um, we facilitated that, and then that caused um, the growing pains that organic has experienced from growing too fast, most recently, like the huge amount of fraud and the need for better enforcement and the absolute glacial um, a glacial effort to move things forward uh, by the NOP and by the activists and how hard it is to change anything nowadays. I, I feel guilty for kind of causing all that. <laughs> I was never surprised by Omri's success. Um, what, what I was surprised at was how fast things came together because when Brian came up to Eugene with his truck, where all that stuff went was into my garage and that's where Omri, <laughs> so for a while, Brian and I had no office. We had bunches of boxes in my garage and I was a young mother, that, that's actually, why I wouldn't move from um, from Eugene was I, I had a young child. Um, and now uh, my child is a 27 year old mechanical engineer. So that that seems to me like that that process of raising the child was going right along with with uh, raising Omri. Um, it went from just kind of hanging out at my house, to becoming a very successful uh, organization with lots of people. I love, I walk by it all the time, although now that, you know, because of COVID, there's not many people at the office at all, but it gives me great pride and pleasure to walk by Omri's office and think, wow, that was, that was so much work. It was, it was not an easy task. Um, it was sometimes very contentious and caused a lot of upheaval in people's lives, including Brian having to move to Eugene to accommodate me. Um, and and yet, it's not a surprise at all because it was a it was something that really needed to occur. Um, right now, we're we're in a very difficult time, like like Zia said, in the organic world because we can't seem to move things forward. But Omri was an example to me of the, the best of the public-private partnership, where private came along, made things happen. We, we still maintain the um, efficacy and the quickness of the private angle of, um, of regulatory structure, and yet we integrated it into the public in a good way with the national list and uh, trying to, to work together with the NOP in many, many different ways. So it was an idea that needed to occur and I'm not surprised at its success at all. You know, I step back and I, you know, I look at these faces on the screen and it, it, it doesn't surprise me either that Omri is successful and it's because of all of you. Um, whether it's Omri or whether it was CCOF or Oregon Tilth, I mean, we, we, we within this industry don't just don't take no for an answer, right? We're passionate. We move things forward. We're small and mighty, um, and so you know we've got a we've got roads ahead of us. I guess I would just encourage all of the staff of Omri, you know. Follow that same passion because you're going to be on the screen someday, I hope, right? You're going to be the ones to say, gosh, I watched that video of those people, um, you know, because it takes it takes commitment and it takes believing in something to, to make it successful. And that's why Omri is here today um, and the whole organic movement is here today. You know, whether it's going to turn out right in 25 years from now who knows but we're all still kicking we're all still engaged we're all still just as passionate um and committed as we were what how many years ago now 30 years ago <laughs> um so anyway that that's my two cents worth uh, i remember um off pana and then ota trying to set goal larger mega goals um 
I'm trying to remember the term that Gene Kahn used to use for for the for the mega goals. Uh, but the point was to to think long term and say, okay, in in five years we want organic acreage to be 10% of all acreage in the United States. That was that was one of the conversations that occurred a number of times back in 20, 25 years ago. And we didn't foresee some of the difficulties and the complexities of the the broadening of the market of the all the issues that would come in to play and and some of them really are not covered well in the Organic Foods Production Act and have had to be addressed periodically and I think we'll see more of that but going from um, in 1989, when, it, when ALAR occurred, I was the volunteer board member to talk to the media, and I expected that was a non-job. But then so, suddenly ALAR occurred, and I, was, I got these phone calls from the New York Times and the Washington Post asking what the size of the organic industry was. And I, we can, we, 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 I compared notes and try, I said, I'll call you back. And we surveyed smuckers and a bunch of other retailers and a bunch of farmers and some farmers markets and we consolidate in three days we consolidated some numbers and said okay we're 750 million dollars in revenue in in end sales and that was based on this this back of the envelope kind of thing and i'll never forget calling the the food editor back at the new york times and she said to me oh my god you're not an industry you're, you're not anything in the food world yet. That was 1989. Well, now what, $55 billion in retail sales, somewhere in that neighborhood, 50 to 60 billion. I think we're still just beginning. I, I think we got a very long way to go and a lot of opportunity if we can, if we can avoid the, and solve some of the internal strife that is occurring continuously uh, over what are relatively challenging issues um, that that exist today around uh, issues that aren't luckily Omri's issues per se because Omri simply follows follows through with what the NOP and, and NOSB regs and core and Mexico but uh, hydroponics and and some of the livestock standards and confinement of birds and all of those issues have created a, a stress that we didn't see coming quite uh, that we need to resolve and and have a better open dialogue about within the community and that that that's difficult to do today but that's that's needed i think the future is awesome for where on we can go thanks yeah, thanks. I, I uh, also was reflecting on some of the things uh, people were saying. And, um, you know, I uh, am at the point of my life, you know, I don't I don't have any children of my own. And I, I think of Omri as kind of my child, you know, and it's like after a certain point, Omri didn't need me anymore. And that's fine. You know, kids grow up, they have their own way of doing things. Um, once Omri got accredited by the USDA, there wasn't really much of a role for me anymore. It was all spelled out in the regulation. Um, USDA NOP issued guidance, and it was up to capable, intelligent, hardworking people to do what was there. And I was a pioneer. I wasn't a settler. Um, I saw Omri as, as, as a way to provide a good livelihood to people who were committed to the organic principles and um, I think Omri has been very influential in moving the agricultural inputs industry to be more sustainable, to, to be more environmentally sound, to reduce the impact of farm chemicals on the environment and to and to help with some of the most challenging global problems we face, you know, cl climate change, um, the uh, water pollution, just a, a whole host of issues that Omri has been able to practically and effectively move agriculture in the right direction. Um, there are still challenges. We still have a long way to go, but
but that is um, I think the the greatest accomplishment that that Omri has has made, and it's it's been somewhat surprising to me to travel to other places and to find people have actually heard of Omri and they actually think very highly of it. Um, it has a great reputation in the world, and that I think is a uh, is quite an accomplishment. You didn't you didn't mention gardening. Um, the, the fact well, is that, gardening. Yeah, I mean. You go to the local, whether it's a any of the big big boxes or chains, some of them won't carry a a product that claims to be used for or for organic gardening unless it bears the Omri seal, uh, and that's true at the Home Depots or the or the Lowe's or the the, the big the big big boxes and even the Ace Ace Hardwares. So it's a lot easier to to send a gardener to the to the store today. Great. Well, on that note, I think we're at time, unless you've got something that you've been dying to say and want to say. Otherwise, I think we'll wrap this up. Anyone, final words that you are dying to, to share with the staff and the, the world? Otherwise, we are very do, appreciative. Do good work. All right. Be careful. Carry on. Carry on. And good yes. work. Carry on. Great. Thank you. Great. Yes. And our, our board you know, has said something similar, which is just keep doing what you do and just do it in more places. So that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> and thank you to our founders, the pioneers who started Omri, who are gonna continue to be our friends and colleagues and partners. And thank you so much. Um, thanks to the staff for joining us and to everyone else in the world who's going to see this. And thanks to all of you. We appreciate it very much. And none of us obviously would be at Omri without all of you here. So thank you very much. And thank you, bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thanks. Thank you for organizing this. Thank Good you. Job.